On my wedding day, my wife stood on the rooftop, dressed in a pristine white wedding gown. She cried and asked me, if I die, will those who hurt me feel guilty? I replied, they won't feel guilty, but I will make them pay with their lives. I will make each one of them accompany you to the grave. If you still love me, if you don't want me to kill, then don't jump. I will take care of you for the rest of your life. She wiped away her tears and managed a faint smile. I'm sorry, but I can't hold on any longer. Every day I live, I just want to die. I looked at her, feeling a deep sadness in my heart. I love her, but if she jumps, I understand her. Chapter 1 That day, I went with my wife to try on wedding dresses. Actually, the first dress was already very beautiful. Just looking at her made my heart race. If it weren't for the crowd in the store, I would have hugged and kissed her right there. She shyly asked me if she looked good. A little boy brought by an adult overheard and immediately shouted mischievously. Wow, so ugly. My wife was upset, so I quickly praised her, saying she was as beautiful as a princess and not to mind the child's nonsense. Only then did she happily say to me, aren't you going to buy a milk tea for princess her highness? Wearing a wedding dress is so hot. I foolishly agreed, running off to buy her milk tea. That was the moment I ruined her life. When I returned with the milk tea, I saw a crowd gathered at the entrance of the bridal shop many of them taking videos with their phones, wondering what was happening. I pushed through the crowd and saw my wife lying disheveled on the ground. The girl I usually pampered like a princess was being pinned to the ground by a woman. The little boy from before stood next to her, raising his hand to slap her. As his slap landed on my wife's face, the woman praised him. Good job, baby. Hit back. My wife couldn't defend herself. All she could do was cover her chest with her hands, crying and begging. Please don't film me. Please don't film me. But the bystanders, relishing the drama, kept their phones pointed at her. I went mad on the spot, grabbing a nearby phone and smashing it to pieces, then rushing into the store to push the woman away and hold my wife tightly. She trembled in my arms, clutching my clothes with all her strength, and burst into tears, seeing her like this broke my heart. I quickly took off my clothes to cover her, asking what had happened, but she just cried and trembled, unable to say a word, holding onto my clothes tightly. In the end, it was our bridal shop sales assistant who told me what had happened. After I left, my wife had taken off the first dress to try on a second one. The little boy's aunt was also there to try on wedding dresses. While she was getting her makeup done and her mother chatted with her, no one was watching the child, who played freely in the store. The mischievous child pulled open my wife's curtain. Many bridal shops have fitting areas in the main hall for better lighting. When the curtain was pulled open, everyone in the store saw her undressed. She was both ashamed and angry and instinctively slapped the child. The child's parents were furious, accusing her of being shameless and hitting their child. They rushed at her, pinning her down, and encouraged the child to hit back. She fights dirty to prevent my wife from having a chance to fight back. She specifically rips off clothes, exploiting others' sense of shame while committing the most outrageous acts. Chapter 2 Countless pains kept magnifying in my heart. I held her, my heart truly aching, as a man, who can accept the girl he protects being humiliated and beaten. Just imagining what she just went through makes it hard for me to breathe. The shopkeeper had already called the police, and they arrived quickly. The woman screamed and cried to the officers, saying she was taking the child to the hospital for a checkup and that she would not spare us if the child was hurt. A policeman came to ask us what had happened, but my wife was still trembling in my arms and couldn't say a word. Seeing her like this made me more scared, so I told the police, can you take my wife to the hospital for a checkup first? She doesn't look well, the woman immediately shouted. What a pretentious coquette. Acting all delicate is disgusting. When I was breastfeeding my child, I didn't care if people saw. What kind of woman acts like such a pretentious coquette? I really wanted to tear out her tongue, but at this moment, my mind was full of worry for my wife's safety. Ignoring the police nearby, I held her and walked out, directly getting into the police car and asking them to take us to the hospital first. At the hospital, the police said this was likely considered mutual assault. The details would have to wait for the injury report. I asked my wife to see the doctor but she was shaking so badly she couldn't walk, so I ended up carrying her into the examination room. The doctor started examining her, and soon he frowned and asked me to step out. I could only leave with my worries. The little boy soon came out, and it wasn't even a minor injury. He ran to his mother, covering his face and crying that it hurt. The woman hugged her child, glared at me viciously, and kept comforting her child. Don't be afraid, my dear. If anyone bullies you again, we'll fight back. I clasped my hands tightly, biting my nails praying that everything would be okay. After a while, the door opened, and the doctor came out, but my wife didn't. He told us, the situation is complicated. The patient is experiencing palpitations and shortness of breath, and she is mentally unstable. I've contacted an ambulance to transfer her to the central hospital. She might have post-traumatic stress disorder. I was stunned, and the woman was also shocked. 
she anxiously said, am I the only one who thinks she's exaggerating? In this day and age, what's wrong with being seen a little? She was even wearing nipple covers. If she's so old-fashioned that this little thing causes mental illness, then she shouldn't come out and harm others. Chapter 3. She didn't finish her sentence, because I rushed to her side, grabbed her hair, and dragged her into the restroom. The nearby police saw the commotion and quickly tried to stop us, but I swiftly closed the door. Since the child was in her arms, he was also dragged into the restroom. There were urgent knocks on the door from outside, and she nervously said to me, What are you going to do? Are you going to hit me in front of the police? You. I punched her in the stomach, making her kneel in pain. She clutched her stomach and screamed, Help, police. He's hitting me. I pulled her by the hair and dragged her to the stall. The little boy fell to the floor, crying and hitting me with his tiny fists. Let go of my mom. I coldly said, Then don't close your eyes. Watch your mom. I pulled the woman by the hair and opened the stall door. She asked me in panic what I was going to do. I said, teach you a lesson. I shoved her head into the toilet bowl, making her face flush, and she started vomiting violently. I pressed her head down and flushed the toilet. I shouted angrily, your mouth is so dirty. Let me help you clean it first. She tried to struggle to get up but was pushed back by me. She wanted to vomit but was forced to swallow it back. The child was crying in fear. Bad man, you're a bad man. I turned to him and said, yes. I'm a bad man. Good boy. Watch closely and remember this bad man's face. The woman was convulsing. And just then, the police broke open the door. I raised my hands and said coldly, I won't resist. Please take my wife to a big hospital. And if this woman is scared too, it's because she's too weak-minded. Please don't let her harm others in the future. Okay. I was taken to the police station and told the police that I was willing to be punished for hitting the woman. But she had to pay for touching my wife. However, life is not a drama. And not everything gets justice. The woman was only detained for a day because she had two children at home and was a breastfeeding mother. She was released quickly. We wanted to pursue criminal charges, but the police said my wife wasn't physically injured, so it couldn't be pursued criminally. As for just post-traumatic stress disorder, it didn't meet the standard for minor injuries. Unwilling to accept this, I took my wife to consult a lawyer, who told us that in such cases, we could only sue for civil compensation. He advised us to let it go. I got angry and asked if we could sue for defamation, something I found online. The lawyer shook his head and told us that the law has special considerations for breastfeeding women. It's almost impossible to imprison her for this, and even if we managed to sue, she would likely get probation or bail. When we left the lawyer's office, my wife kept her mouth tightly shut, tears streaming down her face. I hugged her tightly, and she cried uncontrollably in my arms. She asked me, why do bad people never get punished? I had no answer. To some, paying a bit of money is punishment enough, but to us, the cost of committing a crime was too low. Chapter 4. I refuse to believe in evil. I won't let my girl suffer such a fate. I tried contacting several more lawyers and even communicated with the court. But in the end, everyone told us that the most we could pursue was a civil lawsuit. My wife's mental state was deteriorating. She had trouble sleeping every night, and even when she did fall asleep, she would wake up from nightmares, trembling in my arms. She cried and told me that living in this world was exhausting. That every time she closed her eyes, painful memories would come back. The psychologist advised us to keep her engaged in activities that gave her a sense of accomplishment, and to avoid idleness, as it would only make things worse. As our wedding date approached, whenever she was unhappy, she would immerse herself in the wedding preparations, hoping to forget the pain through busyness. She would temporarily forget her pain, happily choosing flowers, booking dishes, and even designing the wedding entrance herself. But life is not a drama. It relentlessly drives good people to despair. As our wedding day neared, my in-laws suddenly called us back home. When my mother-in-law saw me, she handed me a large red envelope. I opened it to find it full of cash. My mother-in-law said, This is the 50,000 yuan betrothal gift your family gave us earlier. I'm returning it all to you today, plus an additional 30,000 yuan as my compensation. I didn't understand what this meant. She sighed and told me that she hoped we would cancel the wedding. My wife was stunned. She had been busy with the wedding preparations these past days, only to be told to cancel it now. My father-in-law suddenly took out his phone and placed it on the coffee table. I looked at the screen. It was a video posted in their neighborhood chat group. It showed my wife being stripped and beaten in the bridal shop earlier. In the video, my wife was covering herself, begging those people not to film, but they only wanted to watch the drama, ignoring her pleas and capturing her most miserable moment. Not only did this person post the video, but she also said in the group chat, at the bridal shop on Chuanhua Road, the mistress and her men were taking wedding photos and got stripped by the wife. The child was so angry that he beat the mistress. My wife and I were stunned. The situation was clearly not as this neighbor described, but when she fabricated such a story, it made the video content seem very reasonable. She acted very emotional, 
posted a crying emoji, and said in the group chat, even such a small child knows to defend his mother. This woman is truly a filthy vixen. Share this. Expose the wench. It's everyone's responsibility. The chat group was in an uproar. Everyone was cursing and insulting my wife. People blindly believed what they heard. Losing their ability to think independently, I flipped through the phone, but didn't see any response from my in-laws. I asked my mother-in-law, why didn't you clarify? She said, I can't clarify. Fortunately, you were wearing bridal makeup that day, so the neighbors didn't recognize you. As long as I don't speak up, they won't know it's my daughter. Chapter 5 My wife stared blankly at my mother-in-law, trembling as she spoke. Mom, are you just going to let them make up lies so they don't know it's your daughter? My mother-in-law said, I'm doing this for your own good. Things have escalated to this point, you shouldn't go through with the wedding. It's too embarrassing. My wife interrupted her, crying. Mom, I'm not dirty. Why shouldn't I get married? Do you think I don't want my daughter to get married? Use your brain. If you get married, put on your bridal makeup. Everyone will recognize you as the person in the video. Do you think your wedding will be happy? Do you think people will bless you? Or will they secretly laugh at you? I'm doing this for your own good. Why don't you understand? My wife couldn't respond. We both understood what my mother-in-law meant. Even if we could clear her name. Once the wedding took place, my wife would inevitably become a laughing stock at the wedding. These past few days, my wife's mood had been improving slightly. But she finally couldn't take it anymore. She ran into the bedroom and slammed the door shut. Moments later, I heard her heart-wrenching cries from the bedroom. Why am I the only one who gets hurt? I didn't do anything wrong. Why am I the only one who suffers? Hearing her cries felt like a knife to my heart. Indeed. She did nothing wrong. Why should she bear all the pain? We were now faced with the most painful decision. Either swallow our pride and live under the shadow of slander. Hiding our lives and bearing the false accusations to maintain peace. Or speak out for the truth. But this would let everyone know who she is and where she lives. Subjecting her to gossip and whispers for the next decade. Even when taking out the trash. No matter which path we chose. We were the only ones who would get hurt. I tried to open the door. Wanting to hold her. But it was locked from the inside. I said. Baby, can you let me in? She cried uncontrollably. She told me she always thought she would marry me. She saved for a long time to buy herself a big diamond ring. She saved three years worth of bonuses to buy an Audi as part of her dowry. She dreamed of sitting in our little car, wearing a wedding dress, and having me put a wedding ring on her finger. She had given so much, enduring years of hardship, just for the dream of a wedding. Now everyone was telling her, you did nothing wrong, but you can't have your dream. I, too, had tears in my eyes and said hoarsely. We can get married, if you want. I will have the wedding with you. I don't care about people's ridicule. I only want you in my life. She cried and told me that the wedding could never be happy now. Just like her parents said. Once she appeared in bridal makeup. It would only invite ridicule. I said nothing more. I just remembered two people. The woman who stripped her. I don't know her address. But I remember her name is Karen. In the neighborhood chat group. Their usernames are their apartment numbers. The neighbor who posted the video lives in building 4. Unit 901. I said nothing. Just etched these people into my memory. I clenched my fists, suppressing my inner beast. Every woman in this world has a man who loves her deeply. For her, he would do anything. Chapter 6 I need to find that lying neighbor. I must make her understand that some things shouldn't be said carelessly. Since my in-laws don't dare to clear my wife's name in the chat group, I'll go find that person in person and make her tell everyone that she was mistaken and wrongfully accused an innocent person. While my wife was crying in the room, unwilling to see anyone, I went directly to building 4. Unit 901. I knocked on the door of 901, but there was no response. I knocked a few more times, and then the door of 902 opened. It was an elderly couple who looked at me puzzled and asked what I was doing. I said I was looking for the resident of 901. The elderly couple looked at me in surprise and said, 901 hasn't been sold yet. I was stunned. If 901 hasn't been sold, how could there be an owner spreading rumors in the group chat? Thinking there must be some mistake, I decided to go ask the group admin. The neighborhood chat group was not created by the property management but by the residents themselves to make it easier to complain about the property management. I knew the admin's address. She lived in unit 503 of this building. The homeowners committee meetings were always held at 503. I knocked on the admin's door, and luckily someone was home. A woman opened the door a crack and looked at me from behind it, asking what I wanted. I politely said, Hello, are you the admin of the neighborhood chat group? I'd like to ask about someone. Who? I made up a reason and said, the resident of 901 in building 4. She borrowed some money from me and then blocked me. I don't want to argue with neighbors in the group chat and make a scene. But when I went to 901 to find her, I found out the unit hasn't even been sold. The admin relaxed and fully opened the door. She explained that a woman had come to her with a rental contract. 
Claiming to be the tenant of 901, our neighborhood chat group allows tenants to join, but soon after joining, the woman violated the group rules by posting advertisements and was kicked out by the admin. She showed me the ad on her phone. It was a renovation ad. The admin said, some people in the renovation business pretend to be residents to get clients. She probably found out from the housing bureau's website that 901 hasn't been sold and pretended to be a tenant to join the group. But who knew she'd borrow money from people too? I nodded in understanding. Since the group was created by the residents, if it had been created by the property management, her lie would have been exposed immediately. Seeing the woman's phone number on the ad, I called it. But I was stunned by the response. The number you have dialed is not in service. How could it be an invalid number? Did the woman even fill out the phone number incorrectly while violating the group rules and posting the ad? Feeling even more puzzled, I asked the admin, so there's no way I can get my money back, is there any way to find her? The admin suddenly pointed to her ceiling, where I noticed a security camera, she said, when I was running the homeowners committee, the property management kept causing trouble, so we installed a camera, that woman must have been recorded, but I don't know how to use it, my husband is away on a business trip, when he gets back, I'll ask him to retrieve the footage for you. Okay. I thanked the admin profusely and left with some regret, although I couldn't find the slanderer for now. The most important thing was to comfort my wife. I had made up my mind. No matter what, I would have a wedding with her. She is the woman I love the most, and I can't let her be with me with any regrets. Chapter 7. The day of the wedding arrived. I put on my suit, tied my tie, and pinned a boutonniere to my lapel. I knew the wedding was cancelled, but I wanted to tell my girl. I booked the plane tickets, planned to take her to the beach and called a local church to find a pastor. At sunrise, I would put the wedding ring on her finger. At sunset, we would make our vows. Even if our wedding was cancelled, I wanted to tell her, in front of the pastor, that no matter what, sickness, health, poverty, wealth, I would be with her for life. We are not Christians, but to give her a wedding, I would serve the Lord. However, a frantic phone call brought the dream crashing back to harsh reality. When I answered my mother-in-law's call and rushed to the hotel, I saw my wife standing on the rooftop wearing her white wedding dress. My heart ached as if it were being torn apart. I could hardly breathe. I rushed into the elevator, the anxious heat making me loosen my tie. When I reached the rooftop, the door was locked. I kicked the door hard, breaking the lock. I gasped for breath, looking at her back. In the sunlight, her wedding dress was as white as snow. She stood on the edge of the roof in her high heels, looking so delicate and pitiful. I called out, baby. She turned around, her face tear-streaked and sorrowful, crying. She asked me, if I die. Will those who hurt me feel guilty? I said, don't jump, answer me, will you? A sudden panic gripped me, the panic made me hotter and hotter. I loosened the buttons of my white shirt, gasping for breath, they won't feel guilty, but I will make them pay, I will make each one of them die with you. If you still love me, if you don't want me to become a killer, don't jump, I will take care of you for the rest of my life. I took out a cross and showed her the plane tickets, I told her that I was willing to spend every future day with her. She looked at the tickets and called me a fool. She wiped away her tears, forcing a smile. I'm sorry, I can't hold on anymore. Every day I live, I just want to die. A gentle breeze blew, fluttering her hair. She spread her arms as if to embrace me, but her body fell backward, disappearing from my sight. I wanted to scream, but no sound came out. My mind went blank, and my body trembled uncontrollably. When I ran downstairs, she was lying in a pool of blood, her wedding dress stained red. My mother-in-law fainted from crying on the spot. I knelt beside her, trembling and cupped her small face in my hands. I stupidly called her, baby. She didn't respond. No breath. No pulse. I took out my phone to call an ambulance. At that moment, a WeChat notification popped up from the group admin. My husband is back. I'll send you that woman's photo shortly. I ignored the WeChat message and urgently called for help. The ambulance arrived, and the paramedics quickly attended to her. I knelt on the ground, watching her being lifted onto the stretcher. My phone vibrated suddenly. I picked it up blankly and saw the photo sent by the group admin. Looking at the woman in the photo, I clenched the cross tightly. That cruel face, that familiar face, it was her. Karen Wong. I should have killed her when I shoved her head into the toilet. The silver cross was already stained with blood. Heavenly Father, I have no chance to serve you. Heavenly Father, I am about to commit a beastly act. Heavenly Father, am I guilty? The God in my heart tells me. Every woman in this world has a man who loves her deeply. For her, he would do anything, even if it is a sin. Chapter 8. I didn't know Karen's address, but I remembered her child's school uniform from the previous altercation. The uniform had the name Chuanhua Road Chushin Elementary School on it. I got into the car, tears streaming down my face. I kept wiping them away, feeling like I couldn't breathe. I took deep breaths, trying to calm my breathing. I sent a message to the group admin, 
saying I accidentally left the group and asked her to add me back. Then I started the car and drove towards Chushin Elementary School. Suddenly, my phone rang. I wasn't in the mood to answer, but when I looked at the screen, I saw the contact name, bitch. That was the note I had given Karen after our previous conflict. I answered the call. On the other end, I heard her trembling voice, hello, hello. I quietly waited for her to continue. She spoke with a quivering voice, I saw photos circulating on social media about someone jumping off a building. It looks familiar. Is it your wife? I coldly replied. You're the one who pretended to be from 901 and spread rumors in the group, aren't you? She quickly said. Wait, it's not what you think, I asked. Then what is it? Karen cried and explained that there had been a huge misunderstanding. When we were at the bridal shop, I had smashed someone's phone to stop them from filming my wife. After Karen and I were taken to the police station, the child's aunt fixed the broken phone out of her pocket and provided a video as evidence to show that Karen was only holding my wife down and not hitting her. However, Karen was so angry about what I did that she secretly copied the video and found out where we lived, using it to torment us. Karen said anxiously, I only wanted to vent. I never intended to push anyone to the point of jumping off a building. Why is your wife always so extreme? Why does she always choose the most extreme way to solve problems? My God. I interrupted her. Why are you calling now? She quietly said. I finish work at 8. I want to know which hospital your wife is in so I can come and talk to you after work. First people's hospital. I hung up after saying that. But I didn't stop driving. I continued towards Chushin Elementary School. She wanted to talk. But I had no intention of talking. When I arrived at Chushin Elementary School. I hadn't even gotten out of the car when I saw an ironic sight. I saw Karen rushing out of the school with her child. Getting into a ride chair and speeding away. Seeing this filled me with cold anger. Lies. Deception. She said she finished work at 8. But now she was hurriedly picking up her child early from school. All of this was her lies. She was probably trying to run away. If I foolishly believed her and waited at the hospital. She would be long gone by the time I realized it. I followed Karen in my car. Eventually. Karen got out at the long distance bus station. We both entered the station. One after the other. She hurried to the ticket counter with her child. But the child was crying. Mom. I told you so many times I need to go to the bathroom. I can't hold it anymore. Karen didn't agree right away. She checked the departure times first and. After confirming she had time. She took the child to the restroom. She carried the child in a way that his head rested on her shoulder. This put the child facing me. He saw me and widened his eyes in shock. He pounded on Karen's shoulder, shouting excitedly, Mom, the bad man is here, the bad man is here. What bad man? Karen turned around in confusion, and I acted. I grabbed her face with one hand and dragged her towards the restroom. I coldly said, Seems like we always resolve things in the restroom. Didn't get enough last time. The child fell from Karen's arms crying in pain. Karen struggled but was no match for me. I dragged her into the restroom. The child cried loudly. Someone help. A bad man is hurting my mom. Help. I saw the restroom was empty. So I closed the door and locked it. I threw Karen to the floor. Her face was filled with fear as she crawled backward, saying desperately, it's your wife who's too extreme. She's really sick in the head. My God. Jumping off a building over such a small matter. I'll pay you. Is that enough? I stared coldly at Karen. At that moment, the restroom door was kicked hard, making a loud noise. A voice shouted from outside, Come out, men. Don't hit a woman. We've called the police. Come out now. Chapter 9 I ignored the shouting outside. I didn't care how long the door could hold or if they had called the police. I didn't come here to run. I came here to make Karen pay. Karen's face was full of terror as she kept crawling backward. But how big can a restroom be? She huddled in the corner, trembling as I approached step by step. She cried. I was wrong. I was really wrong. Please forgive me, I coldly said. You don't know you're wrong. Your tears and your current attitude are just a disguise because you're afraid of punishment. You're crying to me now. Not because you regret your evil deeds, but because you hope I'll be a fool and let you go. She screamed at me through her tears. I was trying to help you. I was stunned. I asked. What help? She said anxiously. Don't you see? Your wife is the kind of person who has a mental illness. She seeks death over the smallest things. If you stay with her, it will only harm you and mental illness is hereditary. Her genes will pass on to your children, ruining your life. I gasped. I said, you're the one who's sick. You never think you're wrong. You always blame others for your mistakes. You cling to your victim-blaming theory, never considering the crimes you commit. At that moment, the restroom door suddenly banged loudly again. I turned to see the door being kicked open. Of course, it wasn't a security door. It couldn't hold for long. A burly man stood at the entrance, with the little boy hiding behind him. Karen's fear disappeared instantly when she saw the men. She shouted joyfully, Husband, you're here. The men coldly said, As soon as I got your call, I took leave and rushed here. Oh, 
So this was Karen's husband. Karen, with her husband present, was a different person. She laughed hysterically. You think you're so tough? My husband is a bodybuilder. Keep being tough now. I said nothing. Seeing me silent, Karen became even more frantic. Are you too scared to speak now? You're a coward. You only dare to hit innocent women. Let me tell you. I laughed so hard when I saw your wife jump off the building. She deserved it. She hit my child. It's karma. I hope she dies. I hope the hospital throws her in the morgue. Go ahead and let the judge sentence me. I asked a lawyer. Even if she dies. At most. It's just defamation. I get less than three years. That's the fairness of the law. The law doesn't protect bitches like her. Before she could finish, I slapped her across the face. She spun half a circle and fell softly to the ground, her nose bleeding profusely. She covered her nose, screaming in pain. Husband. He hit me. Karen's husband finally couldn't take it anymore and lunged at me. I knew I couldn't beat him in a fight. He was too strong, but I didn't come to fight. I loosened my tie, watching him come closer. Karen's husband grabbed my neck trying to lift me, and I kicked him hard in the groin. He doubled over in pain, and I clenched my fist, punching him hard in the throat. He could barely breathe, clutching his neck in agony. I grabbed his head, raised my knee, and smashed it into his nose with all my strength. The strong Karen's husband lost all his strength instantly. He vomited a mouthful of blood and collapsed to the ground, convulsing. He didn't understand. I didn't come to fight. I came to risk my life. Chapter 10. The public restroom fell silent. Karen was petrified and the little boy stared at me in shock. The security guard, who had initially intended to intervene, now stood frozen at the door. Suddenly, the little boy burst into tears. He ran towards me, hitting me with his small fists, crying, Bad man, you hit my mom, you hit my dad. Yes, I am a bad man. I crouched down, looking the child in the eyes, and said seriously, Remember my face, remember what I did to your parents, and never forget it. I grabbed the little boy and threw him out of the restroom. He lay on the ground wailing. As I slowly closed the door, the security guard didn't dare move. A 3,000 yuan monthly salary wasn't worth risking his life. I had been worried that this door wouldn't hold for long, but now the situation was different. There were handrails at the restroom entrance. I dragged Karen's husband to the handrail, and when she saw what I was doing, she lunged at me. What are you going to do to my husband? I kicked Karen aside and slipped her husband's arm through the handrail, wedging it in the first stall's gap. Then, I took off my belt and tightly secured his upper body to the handrail. After finishing, I tested the door. Every time I opened it a little, it pressed down on Karen's husband's arm. If I continued, his arm would break completely. This was the best lock. With everything in place, I took out my phone and pointed it at Karen's face. I said, confess all your wrongdoings honestly. Karen wiped her bloody nose, trembling as she looked at the camera in terror. She had completely lost her previous arrogance and obediently started speaking into the camera. I am shameless. I snuck into the homeowner group and smeared others. I didn't control my child. It's all my fault. She confessed her sins to the camera, then asked me quietly, can you let us go now? I shook my head and said seriously, do you know the saying, a lie travels halfway around the world while the truth is still putting on its shoes. Your apology may not reach everyone. The only way to ensure people see your apology is to make it compelling and shareable. What do you mean? I mean your apology video needs to have something eye-catching. Hearing this, Karen instinctively clutched her clothes. She screamed hysterically, don't even think about it. I glanced at her, you're overthinking it, I don't plan to strip you. I kicked open the stall door next to us and pulled out the waste bin, tossing it in front of Karen. She was stunned. I pointed the camera at her and said seriously, eat it, that will be more eye-catching than stripping. Karen stared at the waste bin, then leaned closer and began to retch. She cried, just kill me, just kill me already. I frowned impatiently, am I the only one who thinks you're crazy? overreacting to small things and always choosing the most extreme solutions. Why do you always handle minor issues in the most extreme way? I didn't think I was being unreasonable. I was just repeating her words. But Karen was really extreme. She suddenly stood up, crying hysterically, and lowered her head, aiming to crash into the wall behind her. I grabbed her and yanked her back. I forced her head into the waste bin. She struggled in pain as I coldly said, Want to die? Sorry. Your life isn't as important as my wife's reputation. Suddenly. Sirens blared outside. I looked at the time and frowned. So fast. Only a few minutes. But it didn't matter. I never planned to run. Nor did I plan to be taken to court alive. I wasn't afraid of jail, but I couldn't endure a day without her. Chapter 11. Karen lay on the ground. Vomiting. The police soon kicked down the door. Suddenly, Karen's husband woke up in pain. Letting out a heart-wrenching scream. The police outside saw the situation and hesitated to break down the door further. Friend. Don't do anything rash, the officer said helplessly from outside. Whatever your troubles, you can talk to the police. Don't do anything foolish, 
Karen wiped the yellow vomit from her mouth and cried out, Police, shoot him. I ignored them and checked my WeChat. The group admin had already added me back to the group. I immediately posted Karen's video in the group and followed it with three large red packets. Soon, my phone started vibrating wildly. I knew the group was in an uproar. Karen continued to cry. Shoot him already. He's right behind the door. Can't the bullets go through it? The officer outside became anxious. Don't provoke him. And what if we hit you? Friend, whatever grudges you have, we can sit down and talk. I said softly. Don't worry. She won't die for now. Brother, what exactly do you want? I'm waiting for a call from the hospital. I'm waiting for a miracle. I held my phone, murmuring. If my wife doesn't make it, I'll cut out her heart and see if it's black. The officer outside was taken aback and quickly said, Your wife is in the hospital. We'll help you contact the hospital. What's her name? Which hospital is she in? Is it the person who jumped off the building today? Yes, that's her. I felt she had no pulse. I'm waiting for a miracle. Don't worry too much. No pulse doesn't mean there's no hope. We'll contact the hospital right away for you. Just stay calm, and we can talk about any issues. Look, this man here is seriously injured. Let me take him to the hospital first. The sooner he gets to the hospital the more lenient your situation will be. You still have time. Don't make a big mistake. I sighed and stopped responding to the voices outside. They didn't understand. If anything happened to my wife, there would be no discussion. No matter the outcome, it wouldn't matter to me. Suddenly, I remembered the day I proposed to her. Although she said she had scrimped and saved for a long time to buy herself a big diamond ring, I knew she was lying. My wife was a little miser. On holidays, she didn't want gifts, just cash. The first cup of milk tea in autumn. 52 yuan, Valentine's Day transfer, 520 yuan, New Year's red envelope, 1314 yuan, all those numbers with romantic meanings, but I never saw her make any big purchases, until one time she was taking a bath, and I looked at her phone, I didn't intend to check her chat history, I just wanted to use her phone for a verification code to log into a membership to watch a movie, I saw her screen was on a memo titled, Eternal Savings, it recorded every transfer I made, and I saw her target amount, 20,000 yuan. The tag had the price, exactly 20,000 yuan. I knew with the atmosphere set and everyone watching me excitedly, I had to propose. I got down on one knee and asked her if she would marry me. Through sickness and health, for life, we would be together forever. I wondered if she had used eye drops beforehand because her tears flowed like a film star in front of her friends. Well, after saving up so hard for the 20,000 yuan and spending it all, she probably couldn't help but cry. She jumped into my arms tilted her head, and with a smile told me, even if she died, she would haunt me every day, I was so silly then, I just held her and smiled like a fool, I forgot to make her spit three times to ward off bad luck, chapter 12, I overestimated my own strength, I also underestimated the police, I thought they wouldn't be able to easily open the door, but they just opened it a bit and suddenly threw in a smoke grenade, in the small restroom, thick smoke quickly filled the space, making it impossible to see and causing me to cough painfully, with a loud crash, the police broke through the wall next to the door. A second wave of officers used large bolt cutters to snap the handrail at the bottom, then pushed the door open, shouting, hurry. I was pinned to the ground by the police. No matter how unwilling I was, I appeared weak in the face of the state machinery. We were all dragged out by the police, and Karen cried beside them, accusing me of my crimes. I looked at her and couldn't help but laugh. I laughed hysterically. The police came too early. You're not dead yet so I can't get a heavy sentence. I'll keep an eye on you. When I get out, I'll take your whole family. I'll make sure you wake up from nightmares every day, fearing my early release. As long as I'm alive, you'll never dare to sleep. Karen looked at me in terror, clutching the officer's arm and crying. Do you see? He's crazy. Shoot him. Her terrified expression was like a stimulant for me. I couldn't stop laughing maniacally. I was handcuffed and pushed into the police car. Even when I was handcuffed and questioned at the police station, I couldn't stop laughing. The officer taking my statement asked why I was laughing and told me to cooperate. I said I wouldn't cooperate. I would get out and kill their whole family. Even if I died here. Even if I jumped from here. I wouldn't cooperate. A police officer nearby sighed and walked up to me with a phone. The phone had a video call on it. I was stunned. I saw my wife lying in a hospital bed. Weakly opening her eyes. Your wife has been saved. Cooperate. Get out early. And be with your wife. I was stunned. Looking at the video. I finally couldn't hold back my tears and cried like a child. I said okay, I would cooperate. Karen was lightly injured, and Karen's husband had minor injuries, by rights. I should be sentenced to less than three years, but to my surprise, Karen's family provided a letter of forgiveness. I couldn't accept this, I couldn't possibly pay compensation to her family, until the lawyer sat with me and told me that my family hadn't paid Karen's family. 
I asked the lawyer what was going on. He said, here's the situation. From what I've gathered, Karen is terrified of you coming out and seeking revenge. She originally planned to sell her house and move, but the property prices in her neighborhood have dropped significantly. If she wants to sell quickly, she would lose 600,000 yuan. I said in astonishment, how can she be so selfish? Did she consider my feelings? It's hard for me to find her. Don't interrupt. The point is she doesn't want to lose that much money. So she wants to make peace with you. Why should I? She's not asking for medical expenses. And her video has spread widely. Almost everyone locally knows about it. Whenever she goes out, people will say, Look, it's the one who ate shit. I couldn't help but laugh. I liked what people called her. The lawyer said seriously, Her reputation is ruined. And both she and her husband were injured by you. Your wife's injuries are indeed more severe but now everyone knows she was wronged. Karen's family wants to put this behind them and end the cycle of revenge. I fell into deep thought. The lawyer, seeing me considering, said sincerely, do it for the sake of getting out early to be with your wife. A suspended sentence is the best outcome. If you push her too hard, she might lose the 600,000 yuan and send you to prison. I asked, how much did she buy that school district house for? Reportedly, she bought it for 3 million. Got it. I accept their terms. Chapter 13. I was given a suspended sentence. My old company didn't want me anymore. But as the saying goes, a tree dies standing, but a man can always find a new way. I figured losing my job didn't mean I couldn't make money. A government official asked me about my plans, and I cautiously asked if I could open a braised food shop. They said, of course, no problem. They were very supportive of people with suspended sentences working. So, I discussed it with my wife, and we rented a shop across from Chushin Elementary School to open a braised food shop. My friends often came to support me. Whenever school let out, friends would come by to chat and then order a braised duck neck. It was quite a coincidence that whenever they bought a duck neck, Karen's son would always come out of the school gate. I would immediately take the order, grab the duck neck, and go to the cutting board, saying, buy a duck neck. Some friends would say they didn't want to eat duck neck. I said, no, you do. Then I would raise the cleaver, glaring at the boy, and chop down hard on the duck neck with a loud thud. Karen's son would always turn pale and run away. Over time, Karen couldn't take it anymore and called the police. She cried to the officers. He promised not to mess with my family anymore, but he scares my child every day. My child is too scared to go to school. I spent 3 million yuan on that school district house. We've emptied our savings. I said in shock. How am I scaring your child? My goodness. Am I the only one who thinks you're overreacting? I'm just chopping braised food. Officer, look at my orders. I showed him the orders, clearly proving I was selling duck necks at that time. Karen, desperate, said. You have so much braised food. Why is it every time my son comes out, you're chopping duck necks? And why do you insist on chopping the duck neck for every customer? Yes, my duck necks sell well. Chopping the duck necks makes them easier to eat. Don't you sell anything else? We also sell beef ribs, but those need more chopping. Then why do you always stare at my son while chopping? I'm good with my knife. I can chop accurately without looking. Does it matter where I look? I just look at the school gate, thinking it would be a good school for my future kids. Karen turned red with anger and couldn't say another word. My wife tried to persuade the police. My husband is really just selling duck necks. She's overthinking it. I felt it was absurd. What's the big deal about me selling duck necks? Later, for some unknown reason, Karen's son refused to go to school. I felt sorry for him and even had three bowls of rice out of pity. In the end, Karen had to sell the house and move with her child. It's said that she lost not just 600,000 yuan but a total of 800,000 yuan, counting the bank loans. She lost all her money, but my braised food shop was doing well. Many people would come before drinking to buy braised food as a snack, or call me for delivery. They said they respected me as a tough guy. Men should support other men and make friends. Apparently, my story had spread around, and many guys became my supporters. At night, I closed the shop, and my wife clung to my arm, snuggling up to me as we walked down the street. Our new home wasn't far, and we always walked home. I said softly, honey, let's close the shop for a month. She was stunned. Why? Don't you want a wedding? I want to travel with you, get married, and go on a honeymoon. She said in surprise. Are you crazy? We make over 2,000 yuan a day. But the wedding. I'll say it again. Over 2,000 yuan a day. Our regulars are friends now. We can hire employees. If you hire employees, they'll think you've struck it rich and won't want to support you anymore. People are more afraid of their friends driving a Range Rover than not being able to drive one themselves. I hugged her tightly and said feeling wronged. Okay. Suddenly, she turned and hugged me, saying softly, I don't want a wedding anymore. I want something else now. I asked curiously, what? She stood on tiptoe and suddenly kissed my lips, smiling. 
Guess, what I want the most is already right in front of me. After saying that, she turned and skipped down the sidewalk, in the moonlight. I watched her back, thinking hard but still couldn't figure out what she wanted. The thing she wanted the most, right in front of her, I understood. It must be the 2,000 yuan a day.